Well, I just think this whole thing is a real problem. I mean, the over the over prescribing of these kinds of medications is is a crisis. You know, just like the opioid epidemic, it's a crisis, and and it has to start with medical providers. I mean, they have to stop doing that. I mean, there's no other way to stop it because if if you know if they're accessing these prescriptions from a doctor that then it has to start with the doctor. Now, look, I'm not saying that you can't just get Adderall on, in other ways. You absolutely can. But the fact is that, a, that a lot of this is coming from medical providers. And so that, that is something that has to be handled at that level. I mean, it's, it's wrong and there needs to be a lot, a lot more regulation on, on when a doctor can prescribe this and the requirements that need to be met before it's done. And the monitoring of it after it's done. I mean, the fact that there's no, you know, it's not done scientifically. Like there's no, you know, so in behavior science, we would never, we would never begin a behavioral intervention with a kid before we take data on the problem. So for instance, let's go back to that kid in the classroom, right? Let's say Johnny's in the classroom and he has a tendency to get out of a seat and talk out. So, and I'm brought in to intervene. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go in the classroom and I'm going to sit there and I'm going to count in a time period how often this behavior happens. Because number one, the teacher could be making it up. The teacher could say, he's always out of his seat and he's always talking out. And then I go in and I observe him for a week and I only see three instances. So it's actually incorrect. He's not out of his seat and talking out. I don't, and the teacher was wrong. But so I need to go in the classroom and I need to count and measure the behavior that is the supposed problem and identify the severity of the problem. Like how frequently is it happening? Is it, you know, what's the rate we would say? How high, how high of a, of a rate is it? After I do that, then I'm going to come up with some type of intervention, right? Like I said, like some kind of reinforcement schedule for raising his hand and staying in his seat, right? And then I'm going to take data after the intervention's implemented and see, did it reduce the frequency or rate of speaking out and getting out of his seat? And then if it did, then I know it worked. And if it didn't, then I'm going to try something else. So I do it like a scientist. Like that's what we do. But that's not what happens with medication. So doctors are told that there's a problem by a, provide, by a caregiver. They take the caregiver's word for it. There's no data taken of what this problem supposedly is. Then the medication's prescribed and they leave the office. And that's it. There's no evidence taken of the fact that the medication worked to address the issue that the caregiver suggested there was. There's no, and then what happens is parents complain, well, it's not a high enough dose. And then they start messing with doses based on hearsay. It's so not done like science, like scientists operate. It's very odd. And so that alone is a, is telling. If someone is on or taking Adderall mm -hmm. and they don't have ADHD and they don't have ADD and they're using it for performance and weight loss, what does it do to the brain? What does it do to the body? What does it do to the, to the metabolism? What does it do to the person? Well, it's going to be the, so it, it, whether or not you have neurological ADHD or not, the drug works the same way. You know, it's, it's does the, the same things happen um, with the drug. I mean, that's the same thing as if like you drink coffee, you know, like anyone who drinks coffee. Now, some people are very, are more sensitive to coffee than others. Some sure. people can't, you know, some people drink caffeine and they're shaking. And some people like me can drink like a vat of caffeine a day. <laughs> and it's like, I'll sleep like a rock. So, you know, again, it's depends on there's certain elements that make, you know, people more sensitive to, to this stuff than others. But Adderall works the same way, regardless of what, of the profile of the person. So, you know, it's going to have the same impact. But the problem is now you have a dependency on something. And if you have it, if you're using that as a, you know, if you have a dependency where you feel like you can't perform without it, right? Like that's what happens with kids. Like they're like, well, I can't take this test because I don't have my Adderall or I can't study for this because I don't have my Adderall. Or I, if I don't, if I don't have my Adderall, I'm not going to make my weight for this, for my, you know, a lot of wrestlers, you know, in wrestling or, you know, so it all, anytime we have a dependency on something, we're not actually developing our own skills at addressing our stuff. So like if I have a weight problem, well, it's a lot better for me to do the work to figure out why am I overeating or why am I, you know, why am I not, you know, how can I get on a better exercise routine? Like how can I develop some healthy habits? It's the easy way out. I mean, it's like what we want as a culture. It's, you know, of course we want to take a pill and fix a problem because it's easy, but that's actually not how it works. Like behavioral habits 
get established over time and they take time to change. And, you know, it's getting the culture into a better perspective on the work it takes to, to do that. Like the work it takes to establish really great academic habits with kids. It takes, it takes time and, and effort to establish awesome academic habits that aren't drug induced. And it takes, you know, effort to engage in healthy habits like exercise habits and healthy eating habits that aren't drug induced. So it's just the effort required is what people don't want to put in, put forth. Um, which it sounds is, like a lazy hack. Yeah, it is. It's a total lazy hack. Okay. So <laughs> as adults, if we want to improve our focus and be yes. less distracted, maybe you could leave our audience with a bunch of different totally. tactical tips and tricks that maybe you practice. I feel like you're the per perfect person to ask this Yes. in your work, mm -hmm. uh, at school, whatever. Well, here's what I will say. So like any habit, you know, we, first of all, the key is becoming is awareness. So for instance, let's say we have the habit, like we all do of looking at our phone every five seconds, right? Like just like mindlessness without even realizing it, we're looking at our phone or we're working in our office and we're ta like something we call it fit. We work on this task switching, right? So like you're composing an email but in the middle of composing an email, all of a sudden you're checking your schedule and you're checking your Instagram and your Facebook, but you, and you're, but you were in the middle of constructing an email. So, so for adults, and I do this with kids too, I mean, teenagers and adolescents, but the key, the first thing is become aware of yourself. And a lot of the time, the most effective way to become aware of yourself is to actually be nerdy and take data on it. So like how often count throughout the day. Like, so my, my partner, my business partner, one of them, Kendra Newsom, she has, she had a task switching problem where she was constantly switching tasks and she would never finish anything. So she kept a um, sticky note on her water bottle that she had all day. Right. And every time she noticed herself task switching, she'd tally it on her water bottle. And at the end of the day, she'd count up how many task switches she had. I would need like, uh, <laughs> I, I would need like one of those post-it things that you just yeah. take and it just scrolls down. <laughs> Exactly. Well, there you go. 